G'day legends and welcome back to the Cricket Mentoring Show. As always, I have Blake Reed with me, an injured Reedy today. How are you, Reedy? Very good, thank you. Apart from that, it's Apart good to from be here though. Tearing your side in half on the weekend? Yeah. Fire bowl fast? I don't know how I did that bowling 108 Ks per hour, but um, I must be getting old, I think. Yeah, I think that's probably what it is. And we're very lucky to have special guest John Wells, my Perth teammate and good mate. Wellsy, welcome. Lovely to be here. So, uh, yeah, we're going to get into some value with Wellesley. As we did last week with Josh Philippi, we are wearing our masks to follow the rules here in Perth, which hopefully still means the audio quality is good, but we're trying to be um, good and follow the rules with our masks on. But before we get into the show and we talk about what's going on in the world of cricket and we get some value from Wellesley, uh, we do have the cricket, the test match going on in the background, Australia versus Pakistan with Pakistan batting first. Very sad news today out of the, um, Cricket Australia with Rod Marsh, the famous wicketkeeper batsman, passing away at the age of 74. Um, not only was Rod a fantastic cricketer, a sort of uh, wicketkeeper batter, one of Australia's all-time greats, but also he was a selector and he was an administrator and gave so much to the game. Um, so our, our hearts and feelings go out to the Marsh family and everyone close to him. Um, Wells, have you had anything to do with Rod Marsh over the years? Yeah, I have. Like you said, yeah, a very sad day. Um, yeah, fortunate to spend some time around Rod um, whilst he was, you know, jamming the selectors throughout the, you know, coming around to state games and, and seeing him at grounds and having convos and uh, had a bit to do with the Marsh family as well with Paul and Dan. Um, so, yeah, very sad day. Yeah, and now just, just moving on to that, we've got the... From that, the highly anticipated test series between Australia and Pakistan. First time in 24 years they've uh, made the trip to Pakistan. Um, previous years, they've been playing in the UAE against them. Um, we're, we've got, got it on the screen here in the studio. Pakistan won the toss, elected to bat. The wicket looks very flat. Um, Aussies just had a review, um, which was uh, wrong. So they went, Stark went up for the uh, big appeal. Kerry and that said, let's go upstairs. And it was missing going over the stump. So it looks like, yeah, Pakistan could be in for a big score here. Yeah, yeah this, this wicket looks very interesting. It's looked the same for about four days before the games even started. So the, uh, very interesting that. Um, it's going to be a, it's, it's on at a good time over here. You're going to be watching a bit of that, Wellesley? Uh, I'll watch a bit today, uh, tied up over the weekend with big final in club cricket, but um, yeah, I'll be tuning in when, when I can. Lovely, which we'll, uh, we'll get to and find out a bit more about the mighty demons uh, very soon. But um, yeah, very highly anticipated and good to see like an amazing story of Kawaja going back to his place of birth to open the batting for Australia, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, one thing that's been well publicised is Pat Cummins has really... Um, embraced this tour and, and made sure that the group um, are learning as much as they can about the culture in Pakistan and Pakistan cricket as well. And I think that's um, terrific leadership. And why not? Why not go to a new place and, and learn about that culture? It's a fantastic opportunity for these young men to uh, who travel the world. They're fantastic cricketers, but they're also people. So good on them for, for doing that. Now, moving on, the female world uh, 50 over the World Cup has started today with... New Zealand, the hosts, um, playing against the West Indies. When we checked, uh, checked a little while ago, I think the West Indies made somewhere around 250, so that'll be a pretty good run chase. Um, Australia versus England tomorrow. Without no doubt, that'll be a hugely anticipated and contested, hotly contested match between two old rivals. Australia obviously knocked them off during the Ashes series here in Australia, but in England, in New Zealand, it might be different. Um, Aussies may be favourites. They're very good in, in the female game, in the white ball game, but... New Zealand did smack them in the warm-up by about 90 runs um, with Sophie Devine getting 160. Are you going to be watching any of that, Wellesley? And have you got any insights into the female game or um, who do you think will win the tournament? Uh, no real insights, but um, yeah, I think you probably still have to, to go with the Aussie girls. Um, like you said, their white ball form over a long period has, has been exceptional. So, um, yeah, I, I'm sure they'll be uh, right thereabouts. Um, come the business end yeah i think yeah australia is going to be i think the depth of their squad is probably going to be um the key here um with ash garden is actually missing the first two games with um with covid so 
that's straight away that's a test for them but and i think it, i think they enjoy a test and having their backs against the wall i think it brings the best out of them and i think you're right in de- terms of depth and the same um sort of anywhere you go these days is um if someone gets COVID <laughs> or a handful of players get COVID, it's going to be how good are the players beneath that could it might be a, a team that it maybe is ranked fourth or fifth, but they don't get COVID and the other teams, their best six players go out or something. So it could be a COVID-affected um, tournament, but who knows? Yeah, absolutely. I think, though, New Zealand are hitting some really good form at the right time. Their experienced players um, are just a class above. So and I think personally think that um, one of the players of the tournament is going to be Amelia Kerr for New Zealand. She's um, a serious all-round cricketer and I think... Um, this could be her her big time to shine. Yeah, and what a sporting family. I think her sister uh, opens the bowling as well. Um, so, yep. yeah, good luck to the Kerr sisters. Absolutely. Now, we've got India and Sri Lanka over in India. Um, they had a T20 series um, already. That's been wrapped up 3-0 to India. Um, no real surprise there, I'd say. Um, and today, their test series is underway with India batting first. Um, and it's also Virat Kohli's 100th test um, for India. Geez, that's that's flown by really, hasn't it? Um, you had anything to do with Kohli played against him before? No, I haven't. Um, very, uh, very good cricketer, obviously, and I think the greats of the game have always sort of stood up in their 100th test. You, you think about, was it Ponting, twin hundreds? Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's been a while for him you know for his standards um and i'm sure he'll be pumped up and ready to go for his hundredth it'd be a pretty fitting way to bring up your first um, international hundred in a couple of years in your hundredth test with crowds back and um yeah good luck hopefully i'd love to see that there'd be a very virat thing to do um i think in a way he's been trying too hard i think to to get that milestone and be that guy you know but um yeah wouldn't shock me i don't think but um, moving on, we've got England and West Indies um, have been playing, or England have been playing in a warm up game over there. Um, some interesting selections um, with the England squad with no Border and Anderson. Um, I think we were all pretty shocked about that. Two of their absolute grades of the game, but um, they're trying to move that team forward, aren't they? And, um, it's all, yeah interesting to see how it plays out and i think what i read is that they haven't said that they're they're done forever but they just didn't think they were the best options for this series and who knows if there's some politics going on and others um but yeah good to see a guy like craig overton who was over here for the ashes and didn't play a test match good to see him in england's 12 for the one of the warm-up games and um picking a few young guys to sort of see where they're at so that'll be they're usually pretty dry turning wickets in the west indies aren't they yeah, I haven't, I haven't played there personally, but yeah, I think from what you see and the way scores read, it is generally that lower, slower type of wicket, so maybe it's a horses for courses type scenario. Yeah, well, hopefully they get to play, uh, Broad and Anderson get to play again in England and maybe their last series or whatever and get to farewell the English public. Um, but the first test underway on the 8th of March, your mate, well, not your mate, but a guy you know a little bit from... Yeah, um, no, quick... Quick shout out to my old f- or former club in England, Frinton on Sea. Um, a local guy for them who played a bit of cricket there, um, Ben Folks, has returned to the squad. And I think personally, this is probably a year or two too late. I think it showed um, the damage it can do to not play a, like a, a proper specialist keeper in your side. And um, yeah, who knows if they took a few more chances in the Ashes where things could have gone, but um, Ben Folks, is, he is an unbelievable keeper and um, renowned to be one of the best in the world with the gloves on, on any surface. Mm, yeah, well, good luck to big Ben Folks. Hopefully he secures his spot in that team. New Zealand have just wrapped up a series against South Africa and bizarrely only two tests. They were two really good tests, I think, although first test New Zealand smacked South Africa by an innings and 276 runs and then South Africa bounced back to win by 198 runs and in that match Sarel Irwi scored 108 opening the batting for South Africa now he used to play a lot of club cricket in England he played who was it I can't remember the side off the top of my head but he used to dominate the Surrey League he used to absolutely dominate the Surrey League. have you heard of him before have you come across no him I before? haven't no. So, saw the scorecard obviously um, at the test match and uh, yeah first I 
first I'd so seen. So he, he'd be early 30s, I think. Um, and yeah, he used to go to England when I played over there. He's probably in his early 20s then and, and absolutely dominated the Surrey League. So awesome to see from, from uh, doing that for so many years, him to get his opportunity and, and then to take his opportunity in his second test match and show that he's good enough. So, But would have been nice to see a few more tests over there, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh don't get me started. A two test series is just ridiculous, and I will never understand that. Um, I know they're playing towards the World Test Championship, um, but you still got to still got to decide a series. I think I can't I actually can't believe that. Um, but I really, yeah, I really enjoy West South Africa are taking their test test team. I think um, they've got a really good, exciting group that's like really committed to to playing for their country and giving it. Um, giving it, yeah, improving it. Absolutely. Now, Bangladesh uh, hosting Afghanistan at the moment. We don't know a whole lot about that. And the PSL has just concluded um, something you are involved in last year briefly and that nearly happened again this year. Did you follow along and tell us about how you, you, the sort of opportunity to go nearly came about but didn't quite? Yep. No, I did follow it um, pretty closely this season. Um, having been there last year, sort of, you know, knew a few of the players and the teams and, um, it sort of coincided with the obviously the back end of the the big bash. So um, I was quarantining here in Perth um, with Clint Hinchcliffe and not much else to do. So we, we were staying up pretty late watching the the PSL games of the night and um, yeah, watching the likes of Timmy David and you know a few other guys we know doing their thing. Um, so yeah, I mean. Nearly had an op- well, I did have an opportunity to, to get back over there at the back end, the business end for the for the finals, but um, yeah, a few few issues with visas and and whatnot sort of cut that short. So um, silver lining is I, I'm here in Perth playing for the for the Mighty Demons. And Timmy David, we've spoken about him on every show in the last few weeks because of, of the IPL auction. We spoke to him about Flip, but what a great story we've, we've said, but. From your point of view, someone who's been in the Big Bash for so long, and we're going to talk about your career shortly, how does it sort of feel to watch Timmy sort of come from nowhere over the last couple of years and, and then now be this global superstar? Does it sort of... He's in a similar role to you, but he does sort of go... He bats fit further down the order. He does whack him out the park, whereas you're more of a traditional type batter. How do you sort of look at him, his his uh, progression, I guess? Yeah, no, it's awesome to see... Um really happy for Tim and um, yeah like you said it, he he sort of I guess he, he looked at his game and and his strengths and he's he's just really stuck to what he does best and it's he's there's not many people out there that can do what he's doing which is obviously why he's in such high demand at the moment and um, I think it's a matter of time before he plays t20 international cricket um, for Australia and yeah I mean it's it's a great skill set to be able to come out and hit your first ball out the park. Um, I mean, he's a big unit. He's a strong boy, and, yeah, he mishit sixes, which is, you know, something I'm very jealous of. Yeah, well, I, was, I spoke to Darcy Short on the weekend. Um, obviously, you guys, the Perth Cricket Club, were playing against Willerton, <coughs> and Darcy was playing for Willerton, his club, um, while there's no uh, domestic cricket on, and he sort of said, oh, yeah, Tim, we were talking about Tim again, he was saying how big he is and how it's just so good and, and nice to be a big, strong guy to clear the ropes in T20 cricket. And it does really work to your advantage, whereas us sort of smaller grinders, little type guys really have to, and, and you make it look easy, Wells. You've hit a couple um, huge balls. You hit one on the hit the roof at Adelaide Oval or whatever it was, and you do make it look easy. You've got an incredible power for your size, but it must be nice to be a be a big Tim Dave and just miss hit him for six at times. Yeah, oh, absolutely. He wasn't always that big either. He shot up out of nowhere um, around sort of 18, 19, but... Um, I think it's an interesting talking point going into the T20 World Cup. Will the selectors have the courage to pick, um, I guess, an outside sort of option, really? Um, not not playing domestic cricket here a whole lot, um, but he's surely earned a crack just about. What do you think? Is he going to be specialist? in the World Cup? I think he will. I think, I mean, his last probably 12 months... 18 months in, in T20 cricket's been exceptional. And, um, you know, at first you could have, you know, you could have talked about, you know, he's just in a purple patch, but he, he's he's done it, you know, in various comps over the last 18 months um, consistently, which is which is the impressive thing about it. So, um, 
yeah, I mean, I, I always, obviously being a short fella, just just think what it would be like to, you know, spend a fortnight in, in someone like his body and, <laughs> and bat and just see how different the game is. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you look at those guys who are destructive and when you come up against them, you, you try and work out, you know, where you bowl, what their weaknesses are. And being, you know, being big and having big levers, it's just so much harder to bowl to. Their, their arc is huge and you can't really go wide. It's just, just in their wheelhouse. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you'll see with the success he's had, there'll be there'll be different plans against him and, and, and that sort of thing over the next six, 12 months. But at the moment, he's had an answer for everything. And I think one of the reasons he went for so much in the IPL was he's done well in the PSL. Like he's shown that he can play well in subcontinent in those sort of conditions because it's one thing to, to sort of do it in the big bash, but though, like even though the wickets in the IPL are pretty good, I understand they it is a bit different over there and the sort of the pressure that comes with being an overseas player. A lot of guys who sort of have been gone for big money in the auction haven't done so well in the IPL before. So that might have played a bit of a factor. Now... Moving back to Australia, there's some domestic cricket currently going on with Queensland hosting South Australia in the Shield in a very rain-interrupted match. And, and on that note, um, I know we've got followers and, and listeners and fans all over the world and all over Australia, so our, our thoughts go out to anyone listening to this who may be affected by the floods over in the East Coast. It sounds really awful over there. Um, we're very lucky here in the West. Uh, we've got such beautiful weather most of the time, but our thoughts do go out to anyone who may be struggling from the floods, but Queensland seemed to be on top over there. Um, uh, and then WA fly out on the weekend. Um, we were sort of anticipating what the squad might be yesterday when we were having a hit just after the squad had been announced. We were going through a few of the names. 10 of WA's 15 have played for Australia, and they could have picked Marcus Stoinis, but I don't know what's happened there. He was, I think he was available, but maybe he's now injured or something. But... You and I, yesterday during a hit, Wells, you were talking about how good the depth in WA is and how hard it was when you were contracted. You you said yesterday you played about eight games and average mid-40s and, and couldn't get in the side. What do you think it is in WA and, and what a what a luxury to have such depth? Yeah, uh, white ball, the white ball success that, you know, has been in WA has probably last 10 years um, or even longer. I mean, you look at the... The Scorchers in the BBL, most successful team, um, and like you said, WA winning several one-day titles throughout that period as well. So, um, yeah, same same sort of setup when I was coming, when I was in and around that squad. It was, you know, I was one of the only guys there that hadn't played for Australia. So it was a really hard team to to crack into, and and one that you you just have to take your opportunities when they come. Yeah, well, good luck to the WA boys on Tuesday if they win. They make the one-day final, and that's probably a good thing for the Demos. Keep a few of the other um, boys away if the Demos win this week and get into the final. Keep a few of those guys away. Just as I speak, keeping an eye on a few scores, Virat Kohli has come to the crease in his 100th test, so he's two not out of five balls, so it'll be very interesting to see how he progresses there. Um, yes, so over to you, Reedy. Yeah, we're on, moving on to, to you, Wellesie. Um, you mentioned before... You had to spend some time in quarantine after being over in the, the bubble. Um, what have you done since you've been back? How have you been spending your time? Um, I see you most weeks at George Street Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, what have, you, what have you been doing since you've been back? Yeah, I, I did miss George Street Cafe. What a <laughs> ripper that is. Um, since I've been back, just, just trying to spend some time with family. Um, you know, Big Bash was... I think it's nearly three months, you know, away from them uh, this year. Um, so yeah, a bit of quality time with them. See the girls um, back in the office at Icon Sports, and um, yeah, training and playing with with Perth and a couple of hits with with Scalzi. Um, just yeah, trying to get a bit of normal life balance back, I guess, and um, looking forward to. Um, you know, having a bit of a break in, in a couple of weeks' time, hopefully. Did did it did you did it take a toll on you that the bubble life? I know there's everyone has some different views on it, but um, some people have mentioned how hard it is and um, yeah. how, how was it for you? Yeah, it was challenging. Um, you know, I think I coped with it pretty well. Um, but yeah, you can definitely feel for those guys who who go back to back tournaments in in bubbles and you know don't get much of a 
a rest in between, I guess, or, you know, to freshen up and that type of thing. I mean, I, I think it depends. You know, you never know what's happening as well in, in other aspects of people's lives and um, all that stuff can play a part, I think, when you're... And, and again, it, it also probably helps, um, you know, if you're performing well yourself or or if you're not I think that would play a pretty big part because you've got so much downtime to think about things and um yeah it can be pretty lonely obviously not being able to get sort of that escape from the game and um yeah when you're locked up in in a hotel room and thinking about all the things you're doing poorly it's it's probably not a great recipe and what was it like Flip was on the show last week um and spoke about how they had small travel groups to ensure that they didn't sort of interact with too many people. What was it like for you guys at the Strikers? Something similar. I think that um, we've heard that other teams had their, every player had their own room. They, were every, they almost, some teams hired out a, a car for every player so they didn't have to travel together. What was it like for you guys? Yeah, I think, I think across the tournament it was pretty much the same rules. Um, we had travel parties of three or less, basically. So, um, yeah, in my van it was myself, Harry Nielsen and Liam Scott. Um, traveling together all the time and um, yeah pretty much every car had max three people some obviously had less but um, and then like you say no sort of shared accommodation it was just your own room um, one bedroom apartment or hotel room type setup so um, and the only real time you could interact with the other guys apart from playing and training was on the golf course is that right yeah I mean we we got a few games of golf in early which was good Um, but but then as it went and the sort of the restrictions definitely tightened um just just due to our schedule really we didn't we had one or two opportunities to play golf and, and they were sort of morning of game day so um i didn't probably get a hit of golf for the the last four four five weeks of the tournament um it was pretty much yeah at games at training um you know at the airport or whatever like that um but yeah d- d- different bbl setup to obviously the years gone by Yep. And now, before we get into your cricket, and you no doubt will add a lot of value with your cricket, tell us a bit more, which most people probably don't know, even though you, you did give it a good shout out at one point when you're on the mic during the Big Bash. Um, tell us a bit more about your, your role with Icon and, and what you do with them. Obviously, you've got the shop here, you're an owner, but tell people how that is and because people see you playing the Big Bash and then they don't know what sort of you do for the rest of, of the year. So give us a bit of an insight into that. Yeah. It was something I got involved with, um, I was thinking it was about seven, probably seven or eight years ago now, um, down in Tassie, when I, around the same sort of time I lost my state deal down there, um, I was just, I guess, looking for life after cricket and um, was always interested in business and, and that type of thing, small businesses, so um, an opportunity came then to, to get involved and the timing was just right for me, personally. Um, so yeah, got involved there. I'm, I'm a owner, I guess, of um, a franchise in Tassie and then here in Perth um, and, and also involved in one in Port Lincoln. So across those three, it, it keeps me pretty busy. Um, but yeah, just sort of managing director type scenario here in Perth, obviously located here. I'm in there sort of daily. Um, whereas, you know, the other stores, it's more of an overseeing it um we've got employees there that that sort of run the businesses so um just overseeing that and giving giving my thoughts and opinions as as needed but yeah pretty hands-on here in wa nice icon sports um doing apparel and cricket gear obviously sponsored darcy short got a few other good young jordan silk a few other good young players um sam truloff and see yeah, yours. Truloff and um, Jack Clayton. Clayton, who's obviously Clayton come in and moment. done really well in his first couple of Shield games, and and Truloff's been on fire in the club scene in particular, and and on his one day debut last week. So, yeah, good to see the Icon boys doing well. Now, let's get into your own cricket. I'm going to read out a few stats here. You've moved up to fourth on the all-time run scoring list in the Big Bash. 2,554 runs. You're actually one run ahead of Darcy, which is quite nice from you. 30 not outs, which is well and truly the most um, in the top sort of 10 list. Um, an average of 34, a strike rate of 122, a high score of 73. You've been one of the most consistent performers in the Big Bash over a number of years. And then this year was a very good year for you. Second on the most runs, um, 501 runs and an average of 38 and a strike rate of 128. So better than your career stats. 
um, in terms of average and strike rate. Tell us a bit about this season. How do you review and reflect on the season? Personally, obviously, your numbers read well. I know we spoke probably halfway through the season and you thought you were doing some great things but hadn't got the scores maybe you wanted. And then after that, you really kicked on with some, some bigger scores. So how do you reflect on this season, both personally and for the team? Yeah, I mean, personally, I guess um, that was a pretty important year for me, um, you know, being in the last year of a contract and, um, you know, being now seen as older than, than I have been, obviously. So um, I think once you're out of a state system, there's always, you know, a bit bit more, um, a few more questions raised about how you're going to perform and, um, you know, if you're up to it and that at that level. So... From that point of view, I was I was pretty happy with how I went about it. Um, happy with the the numbers as you've just read, um, but more so just how I went about it and how I just sort of tried to enjoy it as much as I could. Um, I actually heard it was pretty early in the tournament, and I think it was it was um, Fraser McGurk was on the the mic in a game, and I was just sitting in my room, obviously watching the cricket, and. Um, he, he just sounded like he was just loving being out there. Obviously, a young guy, um, you know, hasn't had a huge taste of it. High talent, very good talent. Um, but he was just on the mic and, and he was just buzzing to be out there and, and just sort of speaking about just how much fun he was having. And I actually took a bit from that and just sort of said, you know, I'm in the last year of a, of a deal here. Um, you know, I've, I've played in the BBL since, since it started, but... I just want to have as much fun as I can because you don't know when it's going to end. And um, I think that probably took um, a bit of, not pressure, but like just I, I took a bit of expectation off myself to have to do well and just try to enjoy it for what it was. And I think when you're having fun, it, it does reflect in your cricket as well. Well, that's so interesting you say that because Christmas time, a bit over a year ago, I decided I was going to retire. And the one thing I said to myself going into the second half of the season was I'm going to be really enjoy every moment i'm going to enjoy and try and be grateful for little things like being it being on the field with my mates being in the sun being in good weather etc and that was a real focus for me and as a result i played my best cricket in the second half of last year for many many years just by focusing on having fun focusing on enjoying it and taking away the focus from i've got to score runs i've got to do well i've got to do this and who's doing that and who's doing this and it made such a big difference to me and it sounds like it did for you and I think that's a really important message for any player that we play the game because initially because we love it and we want to have fun and if we ever forget that, that's often when we start getting anxious and, and start getting really stressed about things and it's always good to go back to that as a baseline. Yeah, and interestingly enough, interestingly enough i've had similar conversations with 13 14 year old players this week um so yeah that's yeah it's an, a really good lesson and um you hear it a lot but people don't always take it on board and um live by it you know so um going back to the strikers um you had a pretty depleted squad missing the likes of um Kerry and head for most of it um how did the group sort of come together and manage that um, under Peter Siddle as the skipper? Um, did you, yeah, were there many conversations had or was it just business as usual? Or um, I think I think going into the tournament, we sort of knew that we were going to be missing um, some of our better players. There was um, the Aussie A Tour as well was, was happening. So we had Renshaw in that. Um, not sure if there was anyone else off the top of my head, but Head and Kerry, obviously. Um, so from a from a batting unit point of view, we knew we were going to be without a few of our better players, um, and I guess for guys like me, that was that was good in a in a way that you knew you were going to get sort of extended opportunity for the first few games of the tournament to go out and do your thing. And um, but yeah, obviously big losses from a team point of view, and um, you know we got we got Renners back relatively early in the tournament, um, and then obviously Traven Traven cares back late for the. Final series, which was handy, but um, Sids was awesome. Sids was Sids was great. Um, a really big role, I guess, to to lead. Um, obviously, lead the attack, um, and you know, with some inexperience throughout the, throughout the list, he was obviously captaining and and sort of trying to lead the attack and 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 do everything. So, um, 
yeah, I think I think Sid's probably um, early on maybe struggled with that a bit, having to do everything, and um, it was up to guys like myself and um, you know Matt Short and, and other guys to be, I guess, played more of a leadership role um, out in the middle and try and help him out as much as possible because um, captaining in T20 is pretty frantic and, and obviously bowling as well and bowling all the tough overs, it was he had a fair bit on his plate. Just on Matt Short, he had a really breakout season this year and I think it was the first time he's been put up to the top of the order. What do you think or what did you see in, in Shorty that sort of maybe had clicked or had changed from previous seasons? Um, we all obviously knew Shorty was really talented and um, you know really clean hitter of the ball um, and he had shown glimpses of that throughout previous campaigns but he's he, I mean speaking to him it was it was all about the opportunity just to bat at the top and play with freedom really um like I said he's he's one of those guys that you know in a full strength team might have found himself in or out on the fringe of selection and, and if playing with the other three boys at the top he probably would have been playing in that six position seven position whatever it might be so for him he, he knew he was going to get opportunity at the top and and yeah he just grabbed it um it, it was awesome to watch I think he was probably the cleanest one of the cleanest strikers in the in the comp. Um, another big boy who can use his long levers. Another big boy with long levers, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but no, nah, it was awesome to see. Shorty's a great fella, and yeah, he he worked hard, and he like I said, he'd had some sort of um, little bits of success, but a bit of a in and out sort of journey at the strikers up until that point. So um, it was great to see him do well, and um, you know, who knows um, how far he can go from here. I wouldn't be surprised if he's an IPL candidate in the future. Another good big bash. He bowls some spin that's very more better than handy. He, does, he bowls really good spin in the, in the power play. Hits a big ball. He'd be a, a real IPL candidate, I would have thought. Yeah, really good fielder as well. And, um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I thought he, he threw his name in the hat like, like most. And um, I wouldn't have been surprised at all if he did get picked up. Um, you know, he's, he's one of those guys, like you said, he hits a big ball and that seems to be what they like in the IPL, guys that can come in and clear pickets and, you know, have, I guess, multi-dimensions with his spin and fielding. Um, you played a lot of cricket with Alex Carey and Travis Head. Um, what do you notice about these guys and what sets them apart from sort of um, the rest, I guess? Yeah, they're highly talented, but I think when, when you think about, you know, there's lots of guys out there with, you know, similar talent, I guess, but... What, what stands out for me with those two in particular is just their, I guess, fearlessness and their um, probably like their unwavering self-belief. Um, you, you see them, you see when they came back from the, from the Aussie setup and they just go out there and back themselves and they just look like they play with complete freedom, which is obviously a, a big key, but um, not only coming back a level, but that they play the same way when they play for Australia. Um, you know, seeing Hedy's um, test series when he, you know his his innings at the Gabba and um, you look at a couple of the innings he played there it was that was just awesome viewing um, the one in was it at Hobart as well when it was doing plenty and everyone struggled and he just came out and played his way and um, you know I think there's probably been times over his journey where he did question that and struggle with that um, it's always hard to do if, if you play that sort of free flowing higher risk game at does tend to look poor when you get out cheaply doing it, but he just knew that that's the way he plays his best cricket and that was going to give him the best chance to succeed. And um, from what he said, you know, he got backing from that, from his teammates and coaches and, and whatnot, which obviously helps. And, yeah, I think he's he's made, you know, big steps to, to really, um, I guess, nailing it at that level. Now, when they come back in the Big Bash... Do they? I'm interested in how they train those sort of guys with two, uh, in terms of batting. I'm sure Kerry's keeping fundamentals don't change, but they come back from the test series. Do they just try and hit every ball for six in the nets, or are they sort of doing some daily vitamins and then progress into their hitting and range hitting, or whatever? Or is it just 2020? Let's just go bang. Um, oh look, when they came back this year, it wasn't there wasn't a lot of training. Um, it was pretty much into finals and. Um, the actual training facilities we had at the at the MCG were pretty poor at by that stage in the tournament, so um, there wasn't many balls being hit at all. To be fair, but um, I think 
I think it's just training like in that scenario is just getting your, your headspace right. They're coming out of test cricket into T20 cricket. It's a totally different format and um, it's just getting getting your head around how you want to go about it and, um, yeah, hit a few balls here and there, but try not to to do too much. I mean, in a T20 game, you, you're probably going to face max. Well, for those guys batting, you know, up the top, they're going to face 50, 60 balls if they can, but, you know, you might be... Fo- might be facing 20 30 balls um max so training training with more of a purpose and not trying to be in there for hours on end now you've you've got probably one of the most challenging bowlers in the world in your side um rashid khan um you're probably pretty thankful for that to be the case but um just looking around the comp um who are who else is sort of the tougher um opponents you've had to try and counter i guess yeah, I have been very fortunate to dodge Rash um, for a number of years, and it was actually one thing when I when I went over to PSL, um, not the season, just gone the one before. It was he was playing for Lahore, and um, I was basically coming out of quarantine to play in a elimination final, and it and it looked like it was going to be against Lahore the whole time, um, and I was I was trying to come up with a plan on how I was going to play him, um, but as it turned out, they they lost their last few games and missed out, but um, and then again this year, thinking I was, you know, a chance to be jumping on a plane in a couple of hours and heading over there at Lahore, where one of the the teams at the top that we were going to, the team I was going to play for was had qualified and it was the elimination game was against them again. So, um, but yeah, haven't had haven't had to come up against Rash, but like you say, those mystery spinners are all the the toughest bowlers, I guess. Playing that middle order role, you always seem to come out and they're on straight away. If, if they're not bowling there and then because they've just taken a wicket, they're they're on the next over and you've got them straight up. So um, that's probably one of the most challenging things is coming in, starting against a really good spinner. Um, yeah, it's tough work. What What is it that makes Rash so good? It's obviously control. You've got to be have control, know what you're doing, but what else is it? Is there anything that's not so obvious about Rashid Khan that makes him such a good bowler? Yeah, his control, like firstly his pace. Um, and I don't know if you get a proper understanding watching it on TV, but he bowls fast. So he he bowls fast. He's not overly tall. He feels like he's hitting the stumps all the time, but he he gets fizz on it at pace. So um, and then you put control in that. He's he's always there thereabouts, hardly bowling a bad ball, spinning it both ways. So um, yeah, I think. It's just a good package. Like you don't. It's it's becoming more um, common now. I guess people trying to replicate that, but I don't think the guys that have facing Rash over the last five years hadn't haven't faced anything like that. Um, you know, throughout their careers. So um, it was different. And then you put together the pace, the the purchase he gets on it, and his control. It's it's a pretty. Uh, it's a pretty daunting thing to come up against. And it must be the uncertainty of which way it's going to spin as well. With yeah, him. and that's that's the other thing. I don't know how the truth to it, but he reckons he's got about three or four different wrong ones. Um, <laughs> and I wouldn't question it because I've had nets. He, he bowled a lot in the nets in sort of his early first couple of years at the Strikers and I got to face a fair bit of him. And, and whenever I actually felt like I was picking him all right, he'd, he'd bowl another wrong one and it would turn another half a foot and you'd miss it. Um, so I don't doubt that he does have a couple. He, I think he's got one that he he shows you, and um, you know if you if you seem to pick that and play that pretty comfortably, he's he's got other ones that are a bit harder to pick and spin a, a lot more. So um, yeah, highly skilled. Um, what an amazing story! He learnt to bowl leggies from watching YouTube, didn't he? I don't know. I, I hadn't heard that, but he actually, funnily enough, he reckons one of his brothers in his family is is better than he is. Um, <laughs> And we were like, well, we'll get him at the strikers as well. But he said he had a, you know, had too good of a job to, to sort of take cricket seriously. But um, if he's better than Rash, I'd like to see him. Yeah. Something I notice is he he dominates just purely from being so competitive. I think he just wants it so bad and wants to win each each battle with every batter, no matter who it is. You know, so that would be definitely holding him in good stead too. Absolutely, well, you got to compete always, in, and at that level, yeah, all the Better players seem to be very, very competitive. Now, let's shift our attention a little bit. Let's wind it back a gear from professional cricket to grade cricket. 
you are the grade goat. You've <laughs> scored almost somewhere around 30 first grade hundreds, somewhere in that sort of number. Firstly, in Tassie, um, what was your club in Cl- Clarence. Clarence in Tassie? Yeah. 10 or 15. The Mighty Roos. And then uh, now since you've moved to the West, you have you've you now hold the record. Well, last year I think you broke the record for the most hundreds for Perth Cricket Club, 11 or 12, and since then you've got another few. So somewhere around the, the 25 to 30 mark, you probably know. Do you know? Or well, you do know. <laughs> I know how many I scored for Clarence and I know how many I got for Perth. So but... what is the total? <laughs> uh, well, I think I know how many I've got for Perth. Yep. There's a T21 in there, so I'm not sure so if add that, that counts in or not. Add that in I was there. on the end of that too, I think. Was that one? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, great. That was that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think, think you're on the end of two of these hundreds. <laughs> yeah, no, I've definitely seen another, about a f- lot. Another yep. um, <laughs> one at uh, Tompkins one year uh, at Fletcher. Fletcher. A couple yeah. years ago. So how many for Clarence? Sixteen for the Ruse, I think it was. Yep. And how um, many for the Demos? Thirteen. Twenty nine. There you go. Twenty nine first grade hundreds. So amazing, amazing achievement. Um, I wouldn't have minded one or two of them towards the back end of my career, but what what is it about grade cricket that's different? And, and you sort of come back to grade cricket from playing in the BBO. You see a lot of guys, and they actually struggle in grade cricket because the wickets are slower, the bowling's slower. They, they don't have that excitement and that energy to get up for it, but it's something you've not struggled with. You, you dominate and cash in. How do you find coming back to grade cricket? Yeah, uh, I think it's... Again, I think it's important that I actually want to come back and play um, even when I was playing state cricket and and it probably goes hand in hand that I wasn't nailing state cricket so whenever I was coming back to club cricket I, I had to prove myself I had to put a case to get reselected or you know to, to keep my spot in the state side so um, maybe that's maybe that's where it stemmed from early days um, when I would when I would get dropped from the shield team or when I would not be you know, not be in the shield team, I would be playing club cricket and trying to get back in. So um, I just had a real hunger. To, I knew the only way I was going to get in was to score runs and score big hundreds. That's what I got told from a pretty young age that, you know, the way you get picked for things is to to score match-winning hundreds, like big hundreds. You don't get picked scoring 50s and 60s. You get picked scoring 160. So, um, yeah, from an early age, that was something... I just sort of got that hunger to be never satisfied and just to, I mean, who who wants to get out on 60 or 70 anyway? It's the best time to bats when you're on 100 and then, you know, you can, it does feel like it gets a bit easier and you can um, enjoy yourself a bit, I guess, and, and play with a bit more freedom. But um, I think that's probably one of the answers is when I went back, I had to score runs to, to get back in. Um, and then the other flip side of that is I just... I, I don't like when guys come back to club cricket and and sort of they don't want to be there. Um, and we've we've all played cricket where you know you you'd rather just probably have a weekend off here and there. Um, but for me, it was actually wanting to go back and give a bit back to you know club cricket when I was when I was playing state cricket and um, now obviously not playing state cricket anymore. I'm I'm there a bit more regularly, but. It's it's just wanting to be there and wanting to dominate and win games. I think that's probably the answer that keeps me wanting to do well. And I, it's amazing you say that because I reckon the two... I've, when I was sort of thinking about retiring last year and come to the end of my career, I started to sort of think about the players I'd played with and against and I was thinking about picking like a best 11 of guys in club cricket I've played with and the two two blokes that would comfortably be the first two that I picked in top, a team that I played with in grade cricket were you and Adam Voges. And Vogesy was playing for Australia for many years, and, and, but, and there were times when he, you, could, you could sort of tell he didn't want to be playing club cricket. But it he, was, just, yeah, you, he just hated fielding. <laughs> yeah, he didn't enjoy fielding towards the end, but he always made an effort, didn't he? He was always so good, gave so much back to Melbourne Cricket Club, and his result, he got 100 most times he came back because he actually did want to do well and, and help the team. Um, and, and no doubt that's something that's driving you. Perth are going into the semifinals this weekend. The, the last four um, haven't won a flag for 60-something years and, and very, very close. You're the skipper of the club. So that must be something now not so much, not so much about playing at the next level from this but, but really driving team success. 
yeah, and that's it. I, I know my days are done playing, you know, state cricket. So um, it's not about that for me. It's not about trying to churn runs and get picked. It's 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 about trying to help Perth win games of cricket and and you know get closer to that flag. So um, yeah, it's a it's a massive weekend for the club um, this weekend and. Um, you know, there's real excitement around the group at the moment, which is which is great. And um, you know, obviously the the new restrictions aren't aren't great, but I know that there'll be tons of people out there um, wanting us to win this weekend. And um, if if they could, they'd be out of the woodwork and down there supporting us. Um, and and hopefully, hopefully I can go number thirty this weekend and and help us get into a grand final. That'd be that'd be lovely. Well, twenty nine was last week. And now, one thing I want to touch on while we're still on grade cricket is. You've always felt this sense of expectation that you have to score the runs. You're you're the best player in Perth, best player in the comp, and that with that has come an expectation that you, rightly or wrongly you've felt like I've got to get the runs. So I don't know what's going to happen with the other boys. How do you deal with that sort of pressure or expectation? However you want to label it, because I know there's a lot of kids that'll be listening to this and parents who they feel something similar. They're the better player in their team. They feel like, and I have we both have players that come in each week and say. If I don't get runs, we'll get bowled out for so and so. How do you sort of approach that? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think there's definitely times I've fought with it on how to go about it. Um, and you know, I think at the end of the day, regardless, every time you go out to bat, you, you're trying to score the most runs. Um, you've got to be the man that wins the game. Whether that's you know you, you're debuting for a team and yeah, you know, you haven't done it yet, or or if you are the most experienced player, um, I think, yeah, just I guess wanting and and knowing that it's your role to score those runs anyway. Um, you can't control what happens, obviously, and what happens with the rest of the guys and how many runs they're scoring. But um, yeah, trying to to not let it affect the way I guess you're batting, but. Knowing that you want to go out there, you want to score runs. You're not going to be able to every time you walk out to bat. That's that's a fact. And and just backing that, yeah. If you play your way, then more often than not, hopefully you'll you'll get the job done. Yeah, just going a bit deeper into that, um, batting your way. Um, I had the chance to throw balls to you before you did go away to the Big Bash um, at the end of last season. Um, and I just remember throwing you spin, off spin, and your ability to come down and absolutely crush them over the top was as good as I've probably ever seen um, in person. Take us through your overall game plan to spin because I know your, I asked you about that and your answer was simple as, as simple as if I see it up to a right arm off you, I'm going. And it's pretty, it's pretty, it's a pretty clear message, but um, I, wish I, I wish it was that easy for me, but... Um, yeah, what's what are you sort of looking to do um, overall to spin? Yeah, it depends on on what spinner it is. I mean, there's now there's so much so many different variations of spin. I guess you know with the mystery spinners and I mean for for me as a right hand bat, right arm off is my preference. Um, if I like facing skulls in the nets, obviously. <laughs> Didn't we all? Well, <laughs> yeah, got to got to got to let Wells out of my pocket a few times. I reckon. <laughs> I think I fetched a lot of balls down at first. <laughs> Nah, but obviously, you know, if someone can spin it both ways, then it's it's more difficult from the outset. Um, and then it depends on what pace and stuff they're bowling. I mean, again, I, I always got taught um, growing up in Tassie, probably the conditions weren't very spin friendly. Um, and being an opening bat for most of my journey, whenever I sort of come up against spin, it was it was when I was in. I'd been batting for a you know a period and, and had some runs under my belt. So um, growing up, I always loved facing spin. I, I thought it was a bit of a way to get from 60 to 80 pretty quick. But um, as, as you get older and you start facing better spinners, um, you soon learn that it's very difficult. Um, and you've, you know, you've got to basically find a way to play spin. But growing up, I always got taught to try and get down the wicket as much as possible. Um, use your feet. Um, I basically never swept um, and again probably because the wickets I played on didn't spin much so it was either if I can get down the wicket get it on the full or the half volley I will and if I can't I'm basically playing it off the back foot um, and I think being short as well means I can probably play back a fair bit more um, and try and pull and cut and 
and use that to my advantage. But um, yeah, as 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 it progressed, as you face better spinners, you you soon learn that they change their pace and they're a lot harder to get down to. Um, nowadays, a lot more spinners bowl a lot quicker through the air, so I find myself coming down less than I than I would have used to. Um, I've developed sweep shot, reverse sweep. Um, you know, just trying to give myself as many options um, so I can play accordingly as as needed. Um, but yeah, I mean, generally my game plan, I still will look to come down if I can. If someone is giving it some air, if they're bowling flat, I probably won't bother. Um, I'll probably just use, look to use my feet to to get out to the ball or, or get it get back deep and um, and then if someone's on 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 their day and they're nailing their length, then I'll I'll look to sweep more than more than what I would have previously. But um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And and it obviously depends on the situation of the game because you said. To me, yesterday, one of the first things you said was, gee, I was patient against the spinners because <laughs> you naturally, instinctively wanted to take them on and hit them over the top with the field up. But the situation of the game, there was a lot of time, not a huge score you were chasing, and you knew that if you just occupied the crease, you'd be able to cash in later in the day, didn't you? Yeah, and that's, that's another, like, obviously it's different in T20 cricket and stuff, but going back to the weekend in a, in a two-day game and um, you go back to the question about having you know, feeling that expectation to, to need to score the runs. I played that way due to that on the weekend. Um, you know, chasing a lowish total, knowing that we weren't going to um, not be able to chase it. If we batted the overs, I knew we were going to get the runs. So for me, it was it was just accepting that, you know, I had to probably put a few shots back in the rack um, that I'd normally play and probably play a lower risk game just to make sure that I was got the job done for the team. Um so yeah, it was it was tough. I was fighting myself out there not to try and run down the wicket and bang one, but um, yeah, just the situation of the game meant I, I was happy to sit on them and and wait because um, the scoreboard dictated that that's all that was required, I guess. And that to me is batting without ego. And we see, I speak to a lot of my good young players who have a lot of ability, but they haven't learnt to bat without ego, and they try and take the game on at the wrong time, or try and hit a spinner at the wrong time, or hit it inside out over cover instead of just knocking it to the sweeper and that to me is a sign of a high class player yeah manage managing risk um especially over the course of an innings where where you score big runs knowing when to to lower the risk of of playing spin um or when it's time to go you go um it's just so valuable to understand that rather than just having sort of the one gear but um it's handy when you have every shot in the book <laughs> like Wellesley does to spin and um, yeah moral of that story is probably don't bowl spin to him in grey cricket <laughs> no, that's a good good point but also I think it's important we, we highlight that he hasn't always had every shot and at 16 or 20 he probably didn't have every shot and he had he was a bit of a limited player in certain aspects but over the years you've developed all the options in your game a lot haven't you through practice yeah and, and probably come down to T20 cricket as well um, because obviously the pressure in T20 mounts when you've had a couple of dot balls and facing good spinners, you, you're going to get you're going to face dot balls. Um, so for me, it was it was you know what is my boundary option? And you talk about um, a strength of mine was coming down the wicket and hitting over the top. When you when you're then walking out in against good spinners in the middle overs with fielders on the fence and you've got to hit at 100 meters to to hit it over their head, it's a different game. Um, so I had to get other options being, you know, we've, we've spoken already about not being the, the big guy who can miss hit balls 100 metres. Um, I had to then say that that might be risk management, but that's a risk for me to come down and try and bang it over Midon's head when he's sitting on the rope 90 metres away. Um, and, you know, there might be a gap behind. So that's when I started saying the sweep's my better option. I need to develop that and, and be able to move and manipulate the field. So I think that's where... You know that whole practice came came about trying to give myself different boundary options and stuff. Try and everyone speaks about being able to score three sixty, um, and you're a lot harder to bowl to, I guess. And and as a captain, it's a lot harder to set a field to someone who can score um, all around the ground. I guess it, you're trying to get them to hit it in the the spot they least want to. I think uh, uh, as someone that has generally struggled against spin as, as an opening batter sort of getting through the new ball and then 
sort of having to grind with the spinners and not really um, dominate them. Um, I've found that just developing one or two options that you trust um, to at least get you off strike more often um, has can make a lot of difference rather than just sort of sitting and waiting on them, I guess, or um, having sort of six shots in your mind, um, just two or three good options um, and consistent options is probably a good way to go um, for a young player while even you practice. Even one, as you said at the start, even just yeah. a sweep shot or getting back and punching at either side of cover or, yeah, a like reverse sweep or something that gives you the option is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Now, on your sort of, um, your sort of game plan and adapting and stuff, we had Flip on last week and we asked him about his T20 game plan. He's obviously at the top of the order and walks out at none for none every time he bats. Sometimes he's batting first and doesn't know what a good total is. Other times he does know what he's chasing. But you have to be far more adaptable batting in the middle order. You can walk in at two for two for ten, three for, or if you're batting five, three for not many, or you can come in the last few overs and have to go straight away. Plus, having been around for some time now and all the footage that's out there, the teams are... We, we did some work pre-Big Bash of you trying to hit inside out over cover more because you thought that your options of your laps and, and where you had been successful previously might get start to get covered by these oppositions who know you now. How did you how do you approach your 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 T twenty innings from a game plan point of view? Yeah. Um it is a tough one. I, I mean, like you say, there's um so many different scenarios that, that I can be faced with coming in, in the middle and then setting and chasing is different again. Um, I quite like chasing in the fact that it's it's sort of there in front of you, you know what's required um, and, and basically the writing's on the wall on how you need to go about it. Um, setting can sometimes be a bit, bit trickier, not knowing necessarily what a winning total is. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I try and work back from from 20 overs really so if to, to try and explain that it might be if i'm sitting in the dugout and i'm next in then there might be 10 overs left and I'll, I'll sort of give myself say if we were to lose a wicket that next ball i know there's there's 60 balls left in the innings i'm going to face 30 of them basically so I'll, I'll work backwards like that um and that might be the 16th over and all of a sudden it's 12 balls i've got so that'll sort of dictate I guess a little bit to how I'll go about it in, in more so how many balls I'll give myself at the start. Um, and when you say give yourself, I, like what, having watched you closely for the last few years, you're often eight off 10, nine off 11, 12 off 10. You, you don't sort of get off to a flyer, but then you look up your 25 off 19 or your 20 off 13 and you do sort of manage to get a few away there's, there's all, that's obviously part of your plan, which means you don't panic if you look up and you're 8 off 10, do you? Yeah, uh, and that's something that I think a lot of people do do is panic, and it's something that I have tried to make part of my game is that, um, you know, you, you tend to have a bit more success if you panic last. Because um, you can guarantee that, you know, bowlers feeling it as well at, at certain times and, and whatnot, but... Yeah, if I've got if I've got time in the game, then yeah, definitely I'll I'll probably be, you know, somewhere around a run a ball for my first eight ten balls. Um, but that's that's me knowing that you know I've got thirty balls to bat and I can catch up if if I'm coming out with ten balls or you know four overs left in the innings and I know I've got maybe twelve balls, I, I can't afford to do that obviously and you've got to go um, differently. But when I say give myself a few balls, it's not me saying I'm going to lock in behind it and leave a couple. It's it's I'm still ready to, to hit my first ball I face for four. It just means I'm probably not going to take um, a higher risk option in those first few balls. I'm going to, if they go short, yeah, I'm going to try and rock back and pull or cut it for four or six. Um, if they over pitch, I'm going to look to hit it for four through the covers or back down the ground or, or whip it through the leg side or whatever it is. But, um, you know, I'm probably gonna, not going to take an unnecessary risk um, where the odds are probably against me. Um, but if I'm coming in with six balls to bat, then I probably will have to take a risk straight up or, or you know, not necessarily premeditate, but, but try and get myself in a position where I know I can hit a ball to one of my areas, if that makes sense. It certainly does make sense. And I think this is just, 
yeah, there's been so much value in this conversation. I'd have the notebook out if I was listening to this because I know I've, I'm 27, but I've taken an unbelievable amount from um, this chat. So thanks, Wellsy, for all that uh, that insight into your sort of game plans and, and we could um, talk all day. We yeah, could we talk could, all day, but we've time's got to, uh, flying in this wrap, one. Yeah, wrap it up pretty quickly, I think. Um, yeah, so we'll move on to um, the performances of the week um, in the CM community. We've um, a young fellow, our coach Josh Hendry, took seven for thirty-two, playing um, in the age group above in, for Centurions. In the under 15s, um, that's a ridiculous effort for, his leggies. for a young leggy um, to stand up and like, as a, as one of the younger players in the side. That's an exceptional mm-hmm. effort, and he's also a um, highly talented batter, in my opinion. And so, expecting big things from him. Um, Wellsy, your incredible effort, 106 not out, um, chasing down Willerton's score in the the qualifying final over the weekend. That was um, that's Century an exceptional number effort. Number 29. Number 29, if you don't mind. Um, also, Wellesley's, Wellesley's got me in his pocket twice. Yeah, I know. Just, Wellesley I've, nicked I've, you off at on, oh. on 96, Wellesley's come on after not bowling all day and nicked me off. Bowling meds. And then and then a couple of years later, he's bowling leg spin and hit me on the thigh pad and I got given caught behind or something. Like that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there you go, Wellesley. One, one of you there. Yeah, um, glad you brought that up. Yeah. <laughs> um, Actually, and, on that, Skulls, does... Does Darwin cricket count? You being from Darwin? Uh, you can you, count Are that. you going to count yeah. that or not? Yeah, go for it. How many in Darwin? No, just a couple in Darwin. <laughs> so 31. Yeah, well, that's Premier cricket. Absolutely. So we're not going to count league cricket. We won't count English cricket, but 31 Premier Australian Premier cricket hundreds. Incredible. And what was just as impressive, we spoke about this again last night, Juno, what was just as impressive from Wellesley? We're not doing a grinders club today. Um but Wellesley was 13 or 58 balls at lunch last week, obviously chasing 230. Willerton bowled well in the first session, and he knew, as he's just said, he had a bit of time on his side, but incredible patience. And then uh, he was complaining because number four, Sean Roberts, came out and was 12 not out off 11 balls. And it's funny how the game goes like that sometimes, pretty, isn't it? It's pretty funny because I'm in that situation where he was in most weeks where I'm uh, at holding up one end and other blokes are flying, so... Um, you know how it feels, one. but yeah, yeah, fantastic. Not century number thirty-one, and we'll be hopefully talking about thirty-two next week as well. He <laughs> hopefully leads the demons into their first final for some time. Young Darren, fifteen-year-old Darren Jay Prakash scored seventy-four not out of one hundred and ninety-four balls, opening the batting. Fifteen-year-old opening the batting in a final in second grade for Fremantle. So a good grinder, grinder's effort there from young Darren, who's Huge. also also a very good leggy, and he has a very bright future. Another youngster, 14-year-old Corey Sweetman, who's also playing the year above for Fremantle, got 66 not out, opening the batting off only 83 balls, chasing 125 against Wanneroo. So Corey's doing some good things as a, churning as a, them as a young. He's doing very well. I've only been hitting with him for a few months, but he's gone very, very well and a big, bright future for him. And then Fanners and Teague both were playing in a, a two-day game at the Wacker this week, um, a red ball sort of practice match between the squad Sam Fanning got 80, close to 80 or 80 odd opening the batting on day one, and then Teague batting in the other other team on day two got six or 50 odd. Um, so those two doing some great things, and hopefully they're getting close and pressing into that WA Shield squad that will be um, picked and, and announced next week. Hopefully for Perth's sake, Fanners isn't sort of picked and goes away on the Sunday of the final, but he's done. He's had an amazing season, scored the most runs in the competition, and obviously. Teague done some great things at the World Cup and then 100 in his only game back. So those two pushing their name forward and hopefully we'll get an opportunity for Western Australia, if not this season, early next season. Yeah, that's stock standard for those two this year, isn't it? They've um, they really found their feet and um, they're on, on the path to something much bigger, I think. Um, just to finish off, where we missed our predictions last episode with Flip, um, but exciting to bring it back this, this week, um, where... Scores are level two two um, after after the last the last predictions you made um, in those Australian T twenties. But um, for me, I think this first test 
might be a draw. Oh, shock. You've got it on a, out, <laughs> oh, on, out okay. on a limb. No, I just think this, this wicket... <laughs> Absolute flat wicket. This wicket could Pakistan are none for 65 in the first session. Reedy's predicting a draw. That's a good one, mate. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's only going to get more. Now, I am going to go out of limb, and I'm going to say New Zealand are going to win the Women's World Cup at home. So there you go. That's something. Wellsy, you got any sort of... We've put you on the spot here, but yeah. any prediction? Or what about Perth to win the flag? What are you predicting? What, what have you got for us? Wells, 33 by the yeah, end of the season. Is, that's what um, you're predicting. Yeah, I'll predict the Demons flag. Year of the Demons. Melbourne, Melbourne did it in the AFL and Perth CC to do it in the WACA Premier. Right. I'd, I'd love that. I, um, I said to Luke Jury, one of our good friends and, and senior batters at Perth, that the first two years before, so the two seasons prior to me playing grade cricket, joining Melville, Melville won the flag. And then the year I retire, Perth will win the flag and it'll just be either end and I had nothing in between. No two-day flags anyway, but that would be a great result if the Demons uh, did get up next weekend. But first things first, got to beat South Perth at, or at South Perth this week who finished top, so big ass there. So, Wellsy, thank you very much for your time and your insights. Um, very generous as always with your time and your knowledge um i'm sure that our listeners and viewers uh on youtube and, and wherever else have got huge amounts of value as reedy said i'm always learning off you i love sort of throwing balls to you or, or feeding the ball machine because i get an opportunity to see a great player up close and learn and pass that on to our other players so thank you um and yeah good luck tomorrow and over the next couple of weeks 32 and 33 hopefully yeah hopefully that'd be that'd be nice but plenty of work to do like you said and um, yeah, hopefully nice wicket out at Richardson Park tomorrow. And Reedy, look after that side, mate. You're getting old. You can't be bowling 108 anymore. Might be off back to offies next year. Yeah, might be finally done with bowling. But um, my first weekend off from cricket in some time, I, I think I'm still going to enjoy it. So what, what have you got planned? <laughs> oh, just... A lot of... A couple of quiet beers. Tins and cricket. Watching cricket, I think. Yeah, so. lovely. Well, the test match is on, so that'll keep you entertained. So, well, legends, thank you very much for tuning in. We have a great weekend. Have a great week. Back yourself, and we'll see you soon.